Episode 6, Pierre and Mocha, Part 1 After their disagreement in the park, the rest of Pierre's day proved altogether more sombre. Upon returning to the townhouse, he found Mocha had retreated to her bedroom, choosing not to leave it for the rest of the evening. Indeed, at dinner time he ate in abject silence, in the now somewhat repaired remains of the dining room that just days ago him and Mocha had first eaten breakfast in. In the later hours of the day he sat quietly in his study on the old leather armchair, which had now been partially fixed, after Mocha's destruction of it when she had first appeared. Usually she would join him in the study, sitting on a small wooden stool as she read books or made jokes distracting him from his actual work. But tonight the small wood-lined room was silent, but for the ticking of the wall clock. Eventually night drew in and Pierre made his rounds of the large building, turning out all the lights for the evening, with only tin streams of the exterior street lamps lighting the house's large rooms. At that moment the old building felt very empty as he reached his own room, a small enough affair next to his study on the third floor. He couldn't help but feel the walls seemingly swallowing him claustrophobically as he struggled to fall asleep. You can't go, grumbled a truly graveled inhuman voice. Let me go, Golem! That's a damn order, you hear? Let me go! yelled the man's voice back desperately. Jem Havler, the owner of the voice, struggled restlessly against the large, round and stone-crafted arms of the Golem. The creature was one of many new travelling companions him and the Lady Arctic had recently gained. There were others. The jester-like man who was a whirlwind of daggers in combat. The young magi woman who kept claiming to be Ardic's apprentice, though Ardic herself fiercely denied this. The golem, itself a hulking, almost eight-foot mass of rock and mortar, with two hollow flaming eyes and strength enough to match its imposing appearance. In all, there were now ten in Lady Ardic's travelling party. A far cry from the days when it had just been her, Jem, and, or even when it was just the five of them. Of those ten companions, seven now lay dead around Jem's feet. Yes, it had definitely been many years since that carefree day when Ardic had taught Jem was conspiring with her father to stop their adventures. How they had all laughed back then, now the sword master, legendary archer, and even the loyal manservant who had all been there that day, all were dead alongside their newer party members, here on the field of battle. It had happened suddenly, word from the king that an invasion force five or ten thousand strong was on the borders. Ardic's group had arrived to reinforce the battle lines, and for a time it had worked. Around each of Jem's fallen comrades lay a dozen or even a hundred corpses of enemy soldiers, men stabbed with their own spears, others with arrows easily piercing through the cheap armour of frontline footmen, some burned to a crisp by magi abilities, or slashed in the neck by throwing knives. But ten people, adventurers or not, can only do so much against an army of thousands. What is a hero against the military? And so, one by one, they had fallen till they were just three. Jem, who stood clutched in the golem's firm grip, his side bleeding profusely, and his left arm at an odd angle from broken bones. The golem, missing large chunks of its brick construction, barely enough left to stay standing upright. And finally the third member, their great leader and mistress, Saint Ardic herself. She stood a little ways ahead of Jem and the golem and the corpses of the dead, atop a small, slightly scorched rise in the land, a red cape and brown shoulder-length hair fluttering in the strong winds against a backdrop of the setting sun. In the air, the heavy smell of trodden dirt, the metallic scent of blood and bodily decay. In front of her, two things, a cacophony of screams and a typhoon of gleaming swords. The swords flew through the air as though being held on marionette strings, reflecting brightly against the sun, as lines of light darting all across the skyline, like tiny bolts of white lightning. It was impossible to tell if there were a hundred of these blades or a thousand, as they danced across the battlefield in front of Ardig. They cut and sliced and maimed and sawed and stabbed and struck again and again and again. The army before Ardig, thousands of men just below her on the far side of the little hill, fell one after the other, men desperately grappling over the corpses of their own deceased friends, others tumbling backwards, piling the bodies two or three high. Scream after scream, slice after slice, the swords danced through the sky, mercilessly killing man after hapless man, as though they had minds of their own, Ardig's powers pushing to its greatest extreme as she simply stood there, atop the little hill watching, willing the swords to fight on her behest. One hand rested against a single stationary blade planted into the ground before her. They go to her, damn it! Jim roared, trying to break free of the golem's hold on him. Vice Commander, your power has been calculated as inferior to those around us. The golem rumbled flatly, almost in monotone, 
Inferior? Are you saying I'd just get myself killed if I tried to help? The golem looked around itself for the other fallen adventurers of the party, then down at Jem's wounds. We cannot help her now. You cannot help her now. Jem eased his struggling, staring up at Ardig's silhouette as tears formed in his eyes. He knew it was true. He knew he was by far the weakest member of the group. If the others were gone, then he could surely do nothing but get in the way. Yet, still, something new caught his eye amongst the storm of blades in front of Ardig. Her hair. At its tips, the brunette was beginning to change colour, to grey out, then whiten. Oh God, she's pushed too far! Abused her power too much! Jem exclaimed, mortified. Slowly, as the screamers of battle continued, the young woman on the hilltop began to change. Her skin grew paler and her hair, all of it now, began to turn. A few more minutes later and at last it ended, as quickly as it had started. Ten thousand or more men lay dead, piled in mounds of their own rotten comrades. Standing above this massacre, like a sentinel, was the Lady Ardig. Her hair a mesmerising pure white, her skin alabaster, her eyes deeper than ever before, an abyssal crimson red. It's over. The swords fell lifelessly from the air, back to the ground as the chunks of unearthed metal they began as. Ardig collapsed to her knees, supporting herself with both hands wrapped to the hilt of her final blade, her hair and cape still blowing in the wind, as silence finally settled over the scene. Then, one last scream broke through the air. One more soldier rose from the endless mounds of dead, charging up the hill with a weapon raised overhead and a deep, frightened revenge in his eyes. Jem moved fast, the golem finally releasing him. He grabbed his own blade, ran straight past Ardig's crouched form, and in a single flourish, a movement in one hole, cleaved off the final attacker's head. Now it's over. Glancing around to look for any other enemy survivors, playing possum, Jem spotted Ardig smile her thanks for the last minute rescue before falling over completely. He ran to her side before skidding to prop her head against his lap before it could actually hit the ground. Her eyes, and now deep red eyes, fluttered open. Nice save, old friend, she grinned. Ha! That's rich coming from you! I think my one kill will struggle to match your count for the day. Jem laughed hoarsely with little mirth, brushing some of the pitch white hair out of Ardig's eyes. Don't try to talk now. You're injured, and that was bloody stupid, you know, using your ability like that. Ardig smiled again, raising a shaky hand up to caress Jem's cheek. Are the others okay? Jem swallowed hard, considering his response. But then something else unexpected happened. Ardig's hand fell limply to her side, her eyes suddenly rolling shut. Ardig? What's, what's wrong, Ardig? Jem looked up, searching for help, but there was nothing. Literally. Around him it was all gone. The corpses of friend and foe alike, the golem, even the sunset. He stared down at the girl on his lap, reached for her wrist, her pulse. It was gone. No! No, no, you can't! You, you can't die here! Someone! Anyone! There was no reply. The very ground seemed to have vanished. Jim found himself in an endless void with only Ardig and himself left. A dead Ardig. No! No, no! No! This isn't how it happened. You, you abused your powers, but you lived through it, right? You, you don't die here, Ardig. I remember you living through this battle. Ardig! Ardig, please! Please don't leave me alone again! Not again! And then, even her newfound corpse began to fade away, to a place he knew he could not follow. Pierre jutted awake in his bed, the pale light of the moon outside his curtain. He did not bother trying to write this dream down. He could remember it all vividly, and he knew it was false. Yes, a nightmare. I was there. She survived that day, became the, the sword dancer or sword slayer or whatever they call it. Yes, exactly. Pierre suddenly rose his hands to feel his face. He was wet with an outpouring of tears. <laughs> I'm crying. Why the hell would I cry over a, a silly little dream, a nightmare? I don't... I don't want to be alone again. Part 2. Sweat trickled across Pierre's face, mixing with the quickly drying tear stains. He reached to the bedside table for the tissue box, cleaning the mess as best he could in the half-light. That didn't happen. I was dare, and that didn't happen. I'd use her powers to their max, causing a change in her body. And that was it. She beat the army of ten thousand, yes. Then she, she began her conquest, right, yes. Her conquest, empress of the world and all that. He muttered to himself, the bizarre nightmare still lingering in his mind. I don't, I don't want. The words caught in his mouth. He was an adult, after all. A grown man. 
Men don't cry over bad dreams or get lonely. In a sudden movement, Pierre threw back the covers of his bed and sprang out, wearing nothing but his felt pyjamas, and only briefly stopping to grab a torch, he swung open the bedroom door. Quickly he felt his way around the third floor's narrow corridor, not wasting time on the light switch. He made his way round for the banister of the old staircase. Finding it, he began his slow descent, the feeling of soft carpet beneath his bare feet being complemented by the creaking of each step, the long winding steps illuminated only by the spare torchlight. Finally, he reached the second floor and strode over to one door in specific. He hesitated only a moment, staring down the long, eerily empty corridor, before knocking. But before he even finished that, the door swung open by itself. She's not here. Inside was Ardig's room, or marker. The bed covers lazily rolled back and no inhabitants. Pierre started panicking, half running and partly stumbling his way back up the staircase into his study, empty, just how he'd left it before bed. N no. No, surely not. He once more weighed his way down the stairs, and then again down another flight to the first floor, his hands bumping against the bottom end of the banister, where something soft caught his attention. Shining his light on it, he saw a beige frock, Marker's frock. Despite the number of coat hangers and hat stands around the house, she always opted to leave the thing atop the bottom staircase railing. Soft earth clothing was something Marker had been so reluctant to try at first. But in just a few weeks, he could see her growing used to it. He had even seen her looking into a few shop windows on their daily walks around town. Just a, a week, in, in just a week she's become so familiar, like she was always here, brightening up this old, empty house. Moving on from the landing, Pierre went into the dining room, empty like all the rest. He slumped down against the nearest chair, one of the few that had survived his mocker's jewel back on the second day of her being in the house. This house is empty. Marka has left. I pushed her away. I made her leave. And how empty it felt. A home large enough for twelve or more back in Balia had now returned to its single inhabitant. Pierre all by himself in those long, dark hallways, eating alone in that wide open dining room, writing and sleeping by himself on that quiet, isolated third floor, alone. A rustling suddenly caught his attention, a sound like glass knocking against plastic. Pierre sprang to his feet and into the hallway. Walking down to its end, he turned to stand to the only door he hadn't checked, the kitchen door. And there it was. The ceiling light was off, but instead the whole room was illuminated by a brilliant white glow. Maybe not as hot and atom-melting as it had seemed when he first saw it a week ago in his study, but nonetheless a wall of white, and staring into it contentedly, Marker. Don't! His throat caught to the point where the words were little more than a rasp. Marker turned with a start of surprise at the intrusion. Don't, please don't go. Don't, don't leave, Pierre half mumbled, dropping to his knees as though bowing. Pierre, well, what's wrong? Why are you up so, Marker tried. Don't go. I know I have no right to ask this. I said such terrible things about you, and I, I even struck you. I had no right to do that. I will never have a right to do that. But, but please don't go. Tears streamed down his face now and any semblance of his supposed manly facade melted away. I thought I'd lost it all years ago, that I was destined to be alone here on this stupid, unflared planet, trapped to sit in my room on my computer, ostracized and rejected from a society simply for being different, destined to be alone, because that's, that's just how things are. And I was okay with that, I think. Okay with just being here alone. Comfortable, big house, Every item I could ask for, riches galore. But Marka, in this single week with you, I have smiled more than I did in decades. Remembered feelings I thought were reserved solely for other people. Remember that I don't have to hide away in my room like some social reject for all eternity. So please, I, I know I have no right left to ask this, but don't step through that stupid portal. Marka smiled, that slightly mischievous, cunning, and most of all, always exceptionally kind smile. Then you accept me as being... No! Pierre half wailed. No! And maybe I never will. And I'm sorry for that too. I wish with all my heart I could acknowledge you as my Arctic. I really do. But you aren't the girl I once knew. You're not some idealized made-up woman from my head. Instead you're compulsive, cheeky, inquisitive. So very beautiful. And so much, much more human. But I, I think that's okay, good even, because, because you're, you are Marka Umet, my... The words faded again, 
They seem so silly to say aloud, like something he might have written into one of his stupid novels, and yet the words felt so very true. Your friend, Pierre? Mocker finished for him. He nodded. With a grin, Mocker put her hands to her chin as she responded. Well, I guess I could stay a little longer, a trial week perhaps, from now until Valentine's, to see if you really want me around, she said playfully. But I have a condition. Anything. The evil grin faded, and the kind smile returned to Mocker's face once more. She reached out her hand to the white light of the so-called portal, and closed the fridge door. Like everything in Pierre's home, the fridge was an expensive and practical make of thing. Its interior light more than enough to partially light up the kitchen if one, say, came down to get a glass of milk in the middle of a restless night. The fridge door closed, Mucker leaned down to Pierre's still crouching form and grabbed his head into her arms before embracing him fully. The embarrassment of realising the portal had just been the open fridge door faded from Pierre instantly as Mucker hugged him. She was warm, so very warm. When did someone last hug me? I'll stay for the trial period, if you agree to be my valentine, Mucker whispered into his ear. Pierre's face, covered still in tear staining and stress, flushed a bright crimson red. Blushing isn't very manly either, is it? I, I still think it's for children, he mumbled. I don't care, she cooled back. Pierre nodded, finally reusing his arms and returning Mocker's embrace. Then I'd be honoured to be your valentine, if you'll have me.